Hello and welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us again. Uh, today we have a webinar on Defiant Silver Corp. My name is Jacob Willoughby. I'm a Vice President of Research and Analyst at Red Cloud Securities Incorporated. Joining me remotely today are Chris Wright, Chairman and CEO, and Doug Cavey, Technical Director of Defiance Silver. As always, we'll begin today's webinar with a presentation on the company by Chris and Doug, followed by a question and answer period. As a reminder, you can type in your questions at any time, and we'll try to get through as many as we can. But before we begin, I'd like to note that there may be some forward-looking statements made on this webinar, and I would direct listeners to the cautionary notes on page two of Defiance Silver's corporate presentation, which is located on their website. For Red Cloud Securities Incorporated, I would highlight that this webinar is for information purposes only, should not be considered a solicitation to purchase or sell securities or a recommendation to buy or sell securities. Also, we know that this webinar does not take into account the particular situation or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigations and seek their own professional advice before investment. Company-specific disclosures for Red Cloud are the following. In the last 12 months preceding the date of the issuance of the research report or recommendation, Red Cloud Securities Incorporated has performed investment banking services and has been retained under a service advisory agreement by the issuer. And now I'm very happy to introduce to you Chris Wright, Chairman and CEO, Doug Cady, Technical Director of Defiance Silver. Thanks for having us. And um, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we appreciate the, the opportunity to address, uh, address you today and introduce Defiance Silver Corp. Um, for those of you who may be, uh, may be uh, new to the story, Defiance is a Mexican-focused exploration, precious metals exploration company uh, listed on the Toronto uh, Venture Exchange and the symbol DEF. Um, we have approximately 185 million shares outstanding. Um, we have a pretty clean balance sheet, no debt, $10 million in cash, uh, thanks to a very uh, successful raise that we just completed um, last month. Um, the stock is fairly tightly held with uh, management and insiders uh, holding a, uh, a large percentage of, of the, uh, the stock and institutions accounting for another good portion. All told, uh, about 45% of the float would be, would be uh, accounted for under those two categories. Um, before I turn it over to Doug to give you an introduction to um, our two um, key assets, uh, being uh, the Zacatecas Silver asset located in, in uh, Zacatecas, uh, Mexico, and our Tapal Gold Copper asset located um, in Michoacan, southwest of Guadalajara. Um, I'll give you a little background on myself. Um, I am not a, a geologist. I'm a finance guy. I come to the uh, Defiant Silver story by way of uh, my company, Windermere Capital, who is the uh, still the largest shareholder of Defiant Silver. And uh, we first became in, invested and involved in, in Defiance back in 2014, which was obviously a, uh, a very different time <clears throat> for the, for this sector, a uh, very much more difficult time. Um, we uh, we took a controlling stake in the company back then, really with an eye to um, to uh, protecting the key asset then, which was the with the Zacatecas uh, silver asset, um, and um, and moving the company along, um, uh, and turning turning the 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 activity back up once uh, once the uh, market environment had had improved. So um, fast forward to to um, spring of 2019. Um, I joined the board um, as, as chairman, and a couple of months after that, uh, took on the role as CEO. Um, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm, I'm a finance guy, uh, so the easy thing for me, for me to do once we, once I got involved in the day to day, was to was to focus on the company. Um, there were some some legacy liabilities and uh, a bit of a uh, a um, call it a uh, severance hangover um, that were lingering around the company's balance sheet after a, a merger that we completed at the end of 2018. So I set, uh, set, set our, uh, our uh, resources on, on cleaning up that balance sheet um, in the summer of 2019. Uh, we did that effectively and then uh, really turned um, our focus towards those uh, towards the assets that we had at 
As I mentioned, we completed a merger at the end of 2018. We acquired uh, Valoro Resources. And with that, we, we got the uh, Tapal Gold uh, Copper asset. Um, what was important at that time was for us to, to really um, figure out what we had. And, um, and what we wanted to do then was to bring in um, a fresh set of eyes, an independent uh, group with uh, an impeccable track record, expertise and experience that could really just tear these, these, these assets down to, to uh, brass tacks and tell us exactly what we had. Uh, were these assets um, as good as we thought? Um, should we be dealing them? Should we? And and if if we're going to keep them, how how best should uh, how best should we move these these assets forward? So that's where Doug and and the Orquest team come in, into the uh, into the story. Um, we were uh, fortunate enough to uh, to um, be introduced to them around the same time as as um, as uh, I joined uh, as CEO. And they uh, they came in and started working with us at the end of October um, of 2019. Um, what I will do now is I'll, I'll turn it over to Doug to give a, a quick intro on uh, on Orquest and, and his team and uh, talk a little bit about what they found with our assets and and then we can uh, tell you a little bit about what we're planning to do with them going forward. Doug. Thanks, Chris. Uh, thanks, Jacob, and uh, thank you to everybody who's tuning in. So Chris uh, hinted at us being relative newcomers to the Defiance story, October 2019. Um, Chris and I had a discussion about uh, the opportunity at Santa Casio and, and how to move forward. And uh, Orquest themselves have a, uh, we have a, a long operating history in Mexico, uh, good exposure to the mergers and acquisition and development space, uh, both in Mexico, but internationally as well. And uh, that evolved into a, a pretty comprehensive exploration management role. And we really um, found the strengths in the Santa Casio Silver deposit after a pretty, um, pretty uh, high level um, due diligence on the asset. Um, as Chris mentioned, we have two projects within the uh, Defiance uh, uh, company structure. The Santa Casio project, the Santa Casio Silver deposit located in Zacatecas, Mexico as well as the uh, Tapal Gold Copper Deposit. And that's a 1.8 million ounce measured and indicated gold resource PEA level project. So really two different beasts uh, that the, the company's working on right now. Uh, we were first tasked with coming in and, and looking at the Zacatecas district and, and the projects there. Uh, there was a, a looming option payment that was uh, renegotiated and extended until 2023, but a time, uh, we had a, a date by, of uh, September. So we had some a clock ticking to, to really decide what the next steps were. Um, the Zacatecas district is a world-renowned district. It's the uh, largest primary silver producer on earth. Fresnillo is located 60 kilometers away from our project. Uh, the largest open pit gold mine, largest gold mine in Mexico, Penasquillo, is located in the northeast of Zacatecas as well. It's a long history of large mining operations. Um, our project was discovered in the mid 1500s and has been in some way, shape or form of continuous production for the past 450 years. Um, we have an option to acquire 100% ownership as well as an option to uh, uh, option to acquire the 2.5% NSR. So a clear path to uh, total ownership of the asset uh, has a small initial resource, 16.9 million ounces. And that was based on historical work done prior to Defiant Silver's involvement. Uh, since Defiance acquired uh, the option to the project, they completed an additional 5,000 meters of drilling and extended the vertical extent of that resource estimate a couple hundred meters up to about 250 meters in places. Um, the two projects, the Santa Casio and the uh, Lagartos projects, are located on the Veda Grande and Malanoche veins. So the Zacatecas district is of a billion ounce silver camp. Um, Veda Grande is a 150 million ounce historical producer, and Malanoche is really uh, well known right now. Uh, Capstone Mining has been making some tremendous discoveries at their Cozumel mine, uh, demonstrating the uh, depth potential and the capacity for uh, quite prolific uh, exploration discoveries and pretty robust mining operations. They're a 6,000 ton per day operation now, and that looks like it's going to keep getting bigger. As I mentioned, there's about 5,000 meters that have been done since Defiance acquired the property, and there's significant intersections outside of the current resource estimate. Um, the base metals were never tabled into the previous resource estimates, and we think there's some room to grow with, grow with that mineral envelope. As I mentioned, the Zacatecas district, you know, has excellent infrastructure due to its long life mining history, uh, as well, it's got a, uh, a long production history, over a billion ounces in this, uh, in this district, and about 8 billion ounces up at Fresno. That doesn't count last salt, La Colorada, Sombra Rete, or up in Penasquito, Camino Rojo, uh, Concepcion del Oro. 
Uh, it's a very prolific place in the world to look for uh, silver. Uh, we all know Zac uh, Mexico is the world's largest primary silver producing country on earth, and Zacatecas is the largest silver producing state. So it's a great neighborhood to be looking for. We like to think of this project as Fresnillo in the 1960s. Uh, Fresnillo was out of ore in the 1960s. It's now the world's largest primary silver mine. Uh, we have a very similar crustal position and crustal blocks. And we know that discovery focused geoscience works to make these, uh, to make these mine building discoveries. When we first came on the project, we were tasked with stripping this thing down to the foundation, and, and that was uh, not an easy order. Uh, we took all the data, we got it into a uh, you know pretty modern format and started to 3D model it. And uh, some immediate screamers came out at us. Uh, the first thing is there's a significant amount of mineralization outside of the principal Veda Grande structure, both in the hanging wall and the foot wall. Uh, that's important. That's where the big discoveries have been made in the camp. Malanoche foot wall, Cosa means mining. Juan Asipio and, and uh, um, Santo Nino discoveries at uh, at Fresnillo, those are all outside of the principal structures and, and those are large, uh, deep, uh, blind, uh, well mineralized uh, veins. The uh, uh, significant mineralization occurs pretty well around the uh, uh, kind of a bookend zone of, of uh, previous drilling done in 2014, 2015 and 2017. And there's also a number of deep targets uh, that we have within the principal Beta Grande structure. and. Um, we're using this uh, pretty interesting thesis. We know that the guys at Capstone are down about a thousand meters into their system. And we're, we haven't gone any deeper than 400 meters into ours. So we have at least another 600 meters of vertical extent that we can explore for some ore shoot horizons in that uh, Veda Grande structure. But principally we're looking outside of the Veda Grande structure. We do believe there's a large mineral system there. The uh, first, uh, panel of mineralization or panel of, of, of prospectivity that we discovered is about 1.3 by 300, uh, 1.3 kilometer by 300 meter hanging wall mineralized event as parallel to the Veda Grande. Um, and like I said, there's some bookended sections that we'll get into that demonstrate where some of this uh, uh, mineralization might be poking out. The first zone that we'd like to follow up on um, is the Santa, it's the El Mirador Almaden zone. Um, it's a zone that's seen a lot of historical mining. Uh, Santa Cruz Silver was mining up to about 60 meters uh, from our property boundary here. Um, we do have a tabled resource that goes down to about 150 or 200 meters and, and drilling in 2014, 2015, 2017 did extend that uh, vertical extent of the deposit um, or the mineralization about uh, 250 meters below that. But uh, what we did notice is that some of the highest grade drilling encountered on the property, if not the highest grade drilling on the property was all outside of the Veda Grande structure. And you can see here, you know, up to three kilograms per ton silver in uh, mineral package and mineralogy that's completely different to the Veda Grande. It looks to be some type of fault hosted mineralization or a healed fault breccia. As well, surface mapping outlined a large uh, mineralized structure called the Veda Murata. And the Veda Murata extends from multi kilometers across our property. And that uh, has a, uh, a projected intersection with the Veda Grande at depth. And we've seen some alteration to support that as well, some high grade mineralization and other drill holes. Uh, the analogy here is what is called the Santo Nino discovery at, uh, at Fresnillo. In the 1960s, Fresnillo had become marginal and uh, they stepped back to the drawing board and conducted systematic discovery focused geoscience using geology, geochemistry, geophysics. And they discovered the Santo Nino vein, which was three meters of 1,000 gram silver and a gram and a half gold and 1% and combined lead zinc. Uh, very similar to the numbers that we're seeing within our uh, maybe Veda Navidad, Natividad or some of the other hanging wall structures, but we're getting up to three kilograms, half a gram gold and more than a percent combined, actually up to about 5% combined. So a very compelling target that has seen very limited testing to date. And these are just some of the holes that we have designed there. So on the previous slide, 17, uh, sorry, 1404, we have another hole that goes about 100 meters below that, but nothing testing the depths here. So we have a hole that's going to test the hanging wall and the Veda Grande intersection, as well as the Veda Murata intersection. As well, we have a, a deep hole, about a 600 meter hole to the uh, Veda Grande deeps, as well as the hanging wall of the uh, Veda Grande structure. And we'd like to get some holes in the foot wall, a zone that has never been tested before by diamond drilling and has some very significant surface expressions of mineralization. It's about a five kilometer envelope of alteration outside of the Veda Grande. And uh, we're seeing a lot of intense uh, oxidization and, and you know, surface, uh, surface weathering expressions of uh, a deeper vein system. And when you walk down in the valleys, you can see the veins there. They, they light up quite well, and you can see in this photo here, there's some very typical epithermal mineralization just sitting structurally below these things. So we have a lot of evidence that there is a well-mineralized system or a, a well-evolved uh, hydrothermal system in the foot wall of the Veda Grande. 
it just says a plan map shows you sort of where we're, we're targeting and, and what our next steps are going to be. These green dots are our proposed drill holes in our upcoming five to 10,000 meter program. Um, we're not going to step and hit every one of these holes, but uh, just where we're modeling around. Um, up in the panel here, you can see there's a section B to B prime. It's sort of faint, but it's the, uh, it's the right most section. And, and that's the next image that we're going to go to right here. Uh, why this is important is it shows a really uh, strong association, um, uh, cross-cutting relationship association, but um, where we have noticed uh, a significant mineral event that uh, was previously unrecognized and looks to be unrelated to the Veda Grande or a different mineral system altogether. On the right-hand image there, you can see there's some purple veins, and those are the amethyst veins, and that's the last stage of mineralization of the Veda Grande, and it's cross-cut by this thin uh, black looking primary silver sulfide vein, it's an aconite vein, uh, runs about 700 grams per ton silver and cross cut the last phase of beta grande mineralization. So it looks like a, a different pulse or a different mineral event altogether. Uh, we noticed that uh, right before the PDAC last year when we got yarded off the project for you know countrywide shutdowns on mineral exploration projects or countrywide shutdowns from pandemic related shutdowns, um, but right before that, we pulled the next hole down and pulled the section and, and uh, projected where those veins were going. And, and that's my hand holding that piece of core. And I cut that. And you can see that there's abundant silver mineralization. It's about 200 meters higher than the Beta Grande itself. And it, we think it represents a significant buried target. How do we plan to test that? Um, this is just a, a hand-drawn schematic of those three holes there. And, and those three holes were significant holes. They have, uh, you know, 10 to 20 meter, 100 to 200 gram silver intercepts outside of the Beta Grande structure. And so some of the highest grade mineralization that was drilled in those 2017 drill programs. And we intend to test that uh, structure up to about 200 meters below the Parisima tunnel, which is one of the lowest um, levels of um, expansive workings on the project. Well, we have uh, two holes that you can see are different orientation in that little blue strip on the left-hand side. That's where the Veda Murata projects and so we want to test the Veda Murata in those hanging wall structures. The Veda Murata is mineralized the surface and looks to be carrying some abundant grade. And where we're seeing the uh, proposed intersections is where we're beginning to see a lot of these uh, blind or, or these uh, you know, primary silver sulfide events. Another thing that came out of the 2017 uh, workup or when we started to uh, look at the models was that some of the highest priority 2017 holes uh, missed their target depth. Um, this image again, hand-drawn uh, workup, uh, you can see on the right hand side, SAD 9520, SAD 9527, they hit large 20 to 25 meter wide stopes that are backfilled with uh, somewhat mineralized material and they're running about 200 grams per ton of backfill. But that's about where the lowest level of the stoping is and if you were to project where that veining goes to, um, you can see that that uh, SAD 1730 came up short by about 150 meters, but we're hitting the uh, upper level expressions of uh, epithermal mineralization. We have some holes proposed to target a much deeper expression of that Veda Grande vein, and that lines up with some of those primary silver sulfide targets that we talked about in the slide before. So what is our strategy here at Zacatecas? Uh, we're not trying to invent the wheel. We're conducting moderate, modern systematic discovery focused geoscience. That's what we're experts in. Um, we're going to drill deep targets along the Beta Grande. Uh, we look to expand that existing resource envelope. We do have some quantitative data from that 5,000 meters of drilling that was done in 2014 to 2017. We're also going to drill the hanging wall structures and the foot wall structures with the previously identified mineralization and in some of the structural mapping and, and surface mapping that's been done that's pointing us in a direction to uh, or some giving us some vectors as to where we're going to put those drill holes. All in, uh, our focus is to understand what the mineral events and structures are, the mineral system is, and where are we in the mineral system? And that's to identify new targets in a very underexplored area. This property has seen a paucity of modern exploration. Uh, we're conducting the first expansive surface geochemistry program right now. We believe we're the uh, most advanced map that's been done on the property. The last one was done in the mid 1980s. We've got a follow-up re-logging, resampling drill, uh, uh, historical drill hole program going right now. Um, and that's to really understand what the mineral systems at Santa Cassio and Lagartos are. Um, we're seeing new mineralization frequently in, in the hangar, and uh, just about every time we go and step up and do some relogging, we're unlocking some more uh, answers or some more doors to uh, to what we believe is a robust mineral system. Um, and like I said, there's limited drilling in the foot wall, and there's strong surface uh, veining at surface in the foot wall. Uh, drilling in 2020, 5,000, 10,000 meters, testing those hanging wall, foot wall, and the Veda Grande at depth. We're seeing high level epithermal overprinting, deeper epithermal mineralization. So we're seeing the bottoms of an epithermal system being overprinted by the top of another epithermal system. 
Uh, the target is a San Antonio type discovery, and, and that's the target that turned the Fresno mine back on. And they saw a robust 40 years since then, uh, and that's really been bookmarked by those Juan Escipio discoveries by Meg Silver in uh, the early 2000s, late 1990s, early 2000s. We have a large data compilation going on at Zacatecas. In 2018, we purchased Mag Silver's Zacatecas District Land Holdings, as well as their database in the area. It's about a $10 million ex early stage exploration database that consists of about 55,000 meters of drilling on projects outside of the Beta Grande. Um, and everything you're looking for in an early stage database, mag, uh, ge other geophysics, uh, you know, surface, uh, surface exploration, uh, compilation maps, just a, a really uh, a wide, uh, deep data set. Um, and it's about 135,000 hectares, so 1,300 square kilometers over the whole district. So very rich and, and has is going to lead to some additional dis discoveries in the area. In the near term, uh, we've got this property-wide surface geochemistry program. It's going to start with about 2,000 samples over the whole uh, over the whole project. We're about a third of the way through that, 600 or so samples, and we get updates uh, frequently. And that's to fingerprint the mineral zonation and the metal zonation and what the mineral system footprints are. You can't find metal in the wrong part of a mineral system, so knowing where we are is, is paramount to being able to find additional ounces. And then we have some additional permit applications going in to expand uh, our current drill program, our current permitted drill program, and that's to test some of the targets that we've drummed up outside of the uh, principal Beta Grande structure and that are in the current permit area. So um, as with everywhere in the world right now, uh, permitting and operations are, are logistically challenging and a bit slower, but we've seen some pretty good turnarounds on our permit applications. This is a heads up, things are a bit slower than what we're all kind of used to, and, and it's uh, causing a bit of delay on the permitting front, but uh, we're confident that we'll have some successes in that. The next project, um, it's hard to declare whether one is a flagship or not. I don't really appreciate that terminology much. It uh, maybe uh, puts a, a shadow on this asset. Um, DePaul Copper Gold Project is a really well-known project in Mexico. It was discovered, it's a totally different discovery methodology. It's a totally different beast than Zacatecas. It was discovered by regional project generation in the 1960s, been in the hands of a number of majors, um, Inco, Tech, Hecla, and then most recently in a company called Geologics Exploration. And uh, at one point, they had an over $200 million market cap on this asset alone. We purchased it in 2018. We have 100% ownership. There's a 2.5% NSR to the vendors. The current MNI is uh, 1.8 million ounces gold and 812 million pounds of copper. So quite a good sized system. There's been about $27 million spent to date and uh, about 68,000 meters of drilling. Got a PFS done in 2013, a PEA done in 20, uh, PFS done in 2012, PEA done in 2013, and an updated PEA done in 2017, demonstrating some pretty robust economics on this project. Uh, the logistics are good on this asset, and uh, there is a significant exploration target, which is an un, you know, pretty well untested, structurally hosted, uh, structurally controlled, high-grade gold feeder system. The PA that was done in 2017 did demonstrate some pretty robust economics. It's using a base case 1250 gold and 250 copper. Uh, it goes uh, pretty uh, pretty well following a, a positive trend in gold, and it goes without saying that every time this uh, every time the price of gold goes up $250, the NPV of this project goes up $100 million. So very leveraged to the price of gold and very sensitive to the price of gold. Um, the post tax IRR 24%, the payback's 2.3 years on a $214 million capex. Um, we purchased this project for $4.2 million, about $1.39 per ounce equivalent in paper of defined silver. So uh, truly an accretive transaction at the bottom of the market. Uh, it's very uh, prospective in these precious metal prices, and, and we are uh, looking at a number of different optionalities with it. The um, plan moving forward at Topal is a two-pronged plan. Um, right now, when you look at the life of mine production, which is based on a 10-year mine life, you can see right out of the gates, it's a nice, tidy, and high ounce producing operation, over 200,000 ounce equivalent, but over 100,000 ounces per year. And it maintains that steady production profile until about year five, where your ounces start to drop off and your capital costs start to go up significantly. But all in, it's a pretty tidy operation, 10-year uh, life of mine, $214 million initial capex, and it's going to uh, average about 79,000 ounces a year and 32 million pounds of copper. Our goal is to try and get that number up to 100,000 ounces a year without diluting those first few years of production or organically adding ounces to the back end. 
Um, even in its current economic state, the average cash cost about $313 per ounce and your uh, on-site all in sustaining craft. A pretty low cost producer. And so how are we gonna add those ounces to the back end? Some of the highest grade NSR rock that's been drilled on the property and is included in NSR is found outside of the conceptual pit boundaries and is really well demonstrated in the south zone here. Uh, there's 188 meters of a gram gold outside of the pit boundaries, 112 meters of a gram gold in a different hole outside of the pit boundaries. And when you look at the NSR value per ton, you can see that those, uh, those uh, blocks are, are quite valuable for and maybe exploitable as an underground operation as recommended by the PEA. What our first step is to completely uh, remodel the structural geology of the property, and that's underway right now. And that's uh, because of some work in 2017 by uh, Defiant Silver's previous VP exploration, Jillian Kerval, as well as uh, Chris Lloyd, a uh, Mexican structural, ge uh, structural geologist living in Mexico, who had done a complete workup on the structural geology on the property. And it looks that all the gold is lining up on second and third order structures, and those have not been adequately captured in the property. It also needs to be mentioned that uh, this thing has anecdotally been pulled as a copper porphyry for its entire life, which is not. It lacks all the hallmark characteristics of the copper porphyry. Yes, there's copper porphyry style mineralization in certain parts of the property, but that just may be intrusion related. And uh, we don't think that that's capturing the true um, that model. So we're going to get that uh, structural envelope and structural uh, study put into the current pit designs. See if we can get some good histograms on the uh, gold distribution in the structures and then design a drill program to take those uh, inferred ounces and bring them up into a measured indicated category. Um, the other um, prong of this is that there is a significant exploration target that is orders of magnitude higher grade gold. And so when those structures are present and we start to track them on surface and when we see where they line up, we get gold that is uh, occurring at orders of magnitude higher than some of this bulk tonnage stuff that was looked at in the past. The uh, exploration target is a structurally hosted gold system. It looks to be related to an emplacement of a big intrusive center to the north of the property. It looks to be following uh, these second and third order structures. Uh, where these structures are present and when you do uh, get surface uh, exposure, the gold grade and the silver grade is, is uh, quite substantial, up to 150 grams silver at surface and up to five grams gold at surface. And when this target has been tested at depth, it's uh, come up uh, up to 25 grams gold and 565 grams silver. So um, a target that can move the economic needle, but could quickly drill and build some ounces to the book. So Defiant Silver is, uh, is working with two robust resource bases. We have an um, exploration envelope and a mineral envelope to expand the current resource estimate on Santa Casio, but some excellent targets both out in the Veda Grande and at well as well within the hanging wall of footwall. And then we have a very robust uh, resource at, set at uh, Topal that demonstrates uh, productivity in multiple metal price environments. Um, we have a team of proven mine finders, uh, experience management team, lots of experience in M&A, both in country and out of country, and projects that have been explored, uh, have been discovered, explored, and then taken through to mine development and eventual acquisition by majors. And we have a strong leverage to this uh, um, increasing precious metal price environment. Um, the Tapal gold uh, price sensitivity is quite remarkable, as we talked about with the uh, fluctuation in the MPV and the increase in gold price, but Santa Casio has a significant resource upside as well. Um, when you do go through the capital structure of the company, you can see that uh, we're dominantly held by management and institutions. We're very aligned with our institutions and, and we do uh, converse with them regularly and, and we value the input that we can get from them. Um, and really, the, uh, the, the bee's knees on this project is that it is a drill ready, uh, both of them are drill ready exploration projects. Um, we do have walk up drill targets at Santa Casio. Um, and then we have got a lot of systematic exploration and reinterpretation that we can do at Tapal that could yield some pretty substantial high sulfidation or, in, you know, intrusion, intrusion related structurally controlled gold mineralization. Um, these are all highly prospective because we're looking at the basics. We're looking to add ounces and increase grade. And uh, we see where we can do that on both assets. And uh, we look forward to starting with Santa Casio now and rolling forward into the exploration program at Paul. And that's uh, it from me here on the presentation side. Uh, our presentation that's up online has a number of appendix slides that go through uh, a bit more of the fundamentals and, and some of the back end work on the PEA numbers and the resource estimate studies that have been done to date on both Santa Casio and Paul. Thank you, Doug and Chris. That was uh, that was great. Um, and so let's turn now to some some questions. Uh, so first, there's a question from a participant regarding to Paul. 
uh, and the uh, the resource uh, pit uh, outlines. Um, just asking if, if the resource is, is then in two pits or three, or is it one big pit? The current conceptual pit designs as done by the 2017 PEA break down into three pits, the North pit, the South pit, and the Tizate pit. And the actual mine plan there can vary depending on whether you're gonna go um, for a large, uh, there is a component of both oxide and sulfide um, production. And so it does depend what type of outlay of oxide and sulfide you're gonna go after and as to how those pits evolve. This project has been looked at as both a 5,000 ton per day, 22,000, 5,000 ton per day oxide circuit with a 22,000 ton per day sulfide circuit. But there's been numbers thrown around up to about 37,000 tons per day. So that is really gonna be what the, uh, the ultimate pit boundaries look like. But conceptually, there are the three uh, independent pits. Right, and then uh, some of the the highest grade uh, exploration opportunities you were just speaking about are actually entirely out of all three of those conceptual pits, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. The uh, we we'll call them the more epithermal looking targets, just based on the metal tenor flavor. There, um, they're outside of the Tizate pit, north of the Tizate pit. The exploration targets that we really like within the south pit that we talked about that are multi, well, 100 plus meter intercepts of a gram plus material, those are all at depth in the south pit. And those still represent excellent exploration targets, especially uh, given that we are trying to upgrade the resources from an inferred to indicated category. We'd like to beef up that inferred category while we're drilling. It's paramount to get the structure figured out as a number of people have said to me, and this is anecdotal, there's three things that matter in mining. Metallurgy, structure, and structure. And so we aim to get that structure figured out on the back end of excellent metallurgical work done by our predecessors at Tapal. Right, and then just uh, for clarification, there was another question about uh, Senecasio. Uh, that's strictly an, an underground resource and the potential there is really for an underground mining situation. Absolutely, we're looking at this thing and we're looking at the depths of this project. We're looking at blind uh, blind mineral structures as well as depth extensions to the Veda Grande. Uh, the project has historically been looked at in surface uh, operations before. There's a number of uh, backfill stockpiles grading anywhere from 100 to 200 grams. And so there is some optionality on surface uh, development, but the real money is you know, in a 50 to 100 million ounce underground mining scenario. And, and that's what we're targeting. We do have minimum thresholds that we're looking for, um, not to discount the, the capacity to run some of this uh, surface material through the mill, but the real longevity of this asset is in an underground scenario. Right, okay. Uh, very specific question from somebody uh, online here who uh, is quite definitely uh, technical. Uh, so they're asking if there's any work being done at uh, Lagartos right now and what future work is planned there and will you be pro uh, proceeding with Tepal before drilling Lagartos? So our, our plan uh, in the camp right now is uh, once we finish our surface exploration program, which is largely, as I talked about this, mineral system fingerprinting geochemistry, we'll start to move the crew over to Lagartos. Um, Lagartos does have some interesting uh, drilling that was done in 20, I want to say 2012, but in 2009. And they definitely demonstrated a well mineralized system very high up in the system, up to about 350 grams silver was cut on some of the drill holes there. Um, we do have some, again, pretty good walk-up drill targets that you could just go deeper into the uh, follow-up of, uh, of those previous drill holes. However, what we've done is, is really put together a surface and structural map uh, based on the district and the region, and we think that there's some room to move with, uh, with those Malinoche claims. Uh, that being said, we think it's a really prospective target. It is the on-strike extensions of the um, Cozumine mine and the Calicanto, uh, which is worked by Endeavor Silver. And so we're we're looking at following that very linear methodical uh, approach to that um, that development. It's cost effective and it and it fingerprints the system and puts you in the right spot. Um, but that being said, the Lagartos does have some really good walk up drill targets as well. Okay, great. And to uh, answer that question about Tapal, we do we're kind of planning on working both camps at the same time. Uh, we do once we're finished up at San Acacio Surface Geochem, we'll start to start to move them into the other. Uh, district area um, uh, targets that we think are, are very prospective and then uh, and then Tapal workflow gets lifted up but it's a lot of desktop work in, in the outlay of the Tapal work. 
Okay, great. Now, I think uh, a lot of people are, are familiar with Zacatecas, but uh, much less so with Michoacan. So uh, could you tell us a bit about the state and, and perhaps any other uh, neighbors that you have uh, that are exploring or mining there? Certainly, Michoacan is uh, largely off the radar of the Mexican mining scene. It's it's flanked by some spectacular deposits. You're not too far from the Guadalajara gold belt, so it's you know eight to ten million ounce gold systems over there, uh, stones throw away. Um, we're about a four hour drive from Guadalajara, so uh, Guadalajara, of course, is a prolific mining historical mining region south of Jalisco and and uh, this southern extension of some of the Sierra Madre. Now, what's interesting about Tapal is that it's in a um, uh, the Guerrero composite terrain, which is a you know composite uh, a composite stratigraphy of Mexico, and and oddly enough, we think that the San Acasio project fits into a part of that Guerrero composite terrain as well. So even though they're worlds apart, they actually do have some geologic similarities. There's not a lot of other operators in the region. Um, there is uh, there's small scale mining as very similar all over Mexico, and there's some private mining in the area. But this would be one of the larger operations. Another big project in the area, and that's been around for a while, is La Verde Porphyry, and that's a multi-billion uh, ton copper porphyry as well. Um, and that's been in uh, various, uh, you know, hands of production or hands of operation, and that's an old tech project. And so that's uh, maybe a, a geologically analogous uh, project. However, I, I really do like the great things on ours, that we do have a much higher gold rate. Um, as, a, as an access and infrastructure place, um, we're seven kilometers away from the national power grid. Uh, we're seven kilometers away from the national highway. Uh, it's about a four hour drive to Manzanillo, which is one of the largest concentrate shipping facilities in the Western Pacific. And we uh, and we're close to Lazaro Cardenas as well as the DC port. So infrastructure wise is tremendous. Um, Michoacan has been under the radar. It's traditionally kind of uh, other industries are in there. There's some uh, cattle industry and there's some agriculture industry there. But um, in terms of large mine development, it's uh, it's been off the it's been off the beat. Uh, Great. Okay. Um, now, question we almost always get from from companies in Mexico: um, What are the uh, security concerns like? Now, I know in in Zacatecas, uh, it, it's uh, a very very historic mining district, and uh, it, it's it's quite near to the the city of Zacatecas. The access is great, um, so I imagine that um, you know there's almost zero for security concerns there. Um, but I'll let you uh, address that. Certainly. Um, and we do have some experience. Uh, we had been working in Mexico for quite a long time and seen, um, you know, pulses and, and increase in activity of security, you know, changes and regime changes. Um, the best way that I can describe it is, is typically um, they're isolated incidents that are uh, somewhat unpredictable. And your best course of action is to be very transparent about what you're doing and communicate with the right people, the local community, the local stakeholders. Uh, the town of Topalca Tepec is about 45,000 person town. Um, they're very well tapped into this, you know, the local land situation, security situation. And so we have a uh, clear and informed dialogue with them about when we're doing and what we're doing and how we're doing it. And that has led to um, very little, if not negligible amount of, of any security concerns in Michoacan. If you look at NGO ranking maps, Mich Michoacan actually comes in at a, a a, a safer jurisdiction than Zacatecas. And that's based on pretty isolated data points, but it really does come down to these isolated situations or these um, you know, flare-ups, we'll say, for an informal way. Um, there is uh, that happening in Zacatecas. There is that happening in Michoacan. There is that happening in Guerrero, Oaxaca. They are uh, situational and they depend largely on the local community and the local community's capacity to uh, communicate what you're doing with uh, different, uh, different stakeholders of the area. And uh, so we've had some very positive um, uh, work programs there with uh, no incidents, and we, we expect that will continue for. Great. Uh, I didn't know that about Michoacan. That's, that's really interesting. Now, when we first spoke on the phone, um, we were talking about uh, the, the potential for mineralization to really extend at depth, because one of the things that in, in, at San Acasio is that there's, there's not a lot of deep drilling, and some of the bigger, more recent discoveries, uh, especially, you know, one Scipio by Max Silver is deeper down. And uh, when I was looking at the cross sections there, I, I thought to myself that there's, there's got to be something deeper down there that's a source for all of this. And I know that you, you had spoken to Dr. Peter McGaw about that. Could you tell us a bit about that? 
Yeah, that's, you know, that's one of the best things you can do is talk to people who are a lot smarter than you and have a lot of experience finding a lot of metal. And, and we do, we lean on people, we lean on anybody we can with anybody to, that can tell us anything. And that goes to everybody who's listening to this call. If you've got an idea, please share it with us. Um, we were talking uh, uh, multiple systems overprinting these long-lived mineral systems and the depth potential of them. We know just as a close ology, three kilometers away or six kilometers away at the Malinoche footwall mine, they're down a thousand meters into that. And we are 400 meters into ours. There are different structural positions of those blocks. So it's not as easy as saying, oh, we'll just keep going deeper. But we do have a little bit of a different mineral system there. Those Juanacipio discoveries, they're about 600 meters down. Um, we don't have any holes deeper than 400 meters and those holes may have been drilled into the wrong lithology altogether. Uh, we aim to test that 500 plus meter mark with this drill program. The drills that we're bringing onto site are bigger drills so that we'll have no depth capacity issues. And, uh, you know, conversations that we've had about these uh, these types of things and, and the words that stick in mind to me that with uh, with Dr. McGaw about the conversation was don't go too shallow. Don't hit the top of another system or you won't be able to get the investor interest to keep going deeper into the system. So put that big hole into the system, make sure it's paramount to get deep in there. The concepts there, the, the indicators are there. Um, we do have a lot more the surface work and drum up work, targeting work, ongoing targeting work to help us uh, guide where the drill is going to go. Um, but that deep, that deep test has never been done. And uh, the, the vectors are there and the, it's not exactly a bullseye target. There's structural complexities, there's um, structural offsets, there's domains, but the, 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 everything's pointing to go deeper in the system. And those who have done it have been very successful. And, and we're really not trying to reinvent the wheel here. We're just trying to, to piggyback on where the successes and where the discoveries have been made and how did they do it? You know, following a linear approach, we still have some geophysics to do. And that was key in the Juan Scipio discoveries. But we're a little bit more advanced in what we know about the targeting and the surface drilling of our property was they were targeting a deep, a deep target right away. Um, and, and it worked, of course, very well for them. So, um, and we're really just gonna follow a lot of those same methodologies. What did Fresnillo do in the 60s? Um, our senior geologist in Mexico, Miguel, he, um, he was on the ground with Fresnillo when they were looking for those Santo Nino discoveries. And he came over to Veda, you know, they were in the 60s at Veda Grande uh, they had an option on the property to find mill feed for the Fresnillo mine, and Miguel was part of that team. So um, we're very uh, we're very confident we can replicate a lot of those ex exploration methodologies, and they'll lead to some pretty excellent targets. Great. Well, thanks very much for that. Uh, we're running up to about forty five minutes, so I think we'll uh, we'll close up here. Uh, obviously, I uh, really want to thank. Uh, both of you, Chris and Doug, for, for taking the time to be with us, as well as the, the audience members for participating in this webinar and, uh, and their questions. Uh, the next Red Cloud webinar will be with Blue Star Gold on October 29th at 2 p.m., which I will be hosting. Uh, and as for next week, we are having our virtual Oktoberfest Fall Mining Showcase, uh, where we're hosting over 50 companies that will be presenting. Uh, we expect over 500 participants, uh, and we will have uh, two keynote speakers, including Ross Beatty and David Rosenberg. And uh, anyone can register for that on our website, which is redcloudfs.com. And uh, we hope to see you all then. Thanks again, and uh, stay safe, everyone. Thank you very much.